My name is Agena Kason Rogers, and I'm the Supervisory Park Ranger at Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site. I worked at Valley Forge National Historic Park for 13 years minus two days. One day, uh, I was there at Washington's headquarters when a teacher came in and she was doing some research for a program, a research for an education program for her students. She came from Fredericksburg, Virginia, and we started doing a little small talk there. And I went into my uh, normal greeting. Welcome to Washington's headquarters. This is the place where General Washington and his uh, staff lived for the six months of the Valley Forge winter encampment. Then she turned to me and said, but who else was here? What about the others who were here? And at that point, I couldn't give her an answer. I had known their names, had read about them in the book, in the daily record books, but had not really delved deep at that point into finding out their individual stories. Nor did I realize that there were people who might want to know about that, who are others who might be interested in the things that interested me. So because of that one question from a visitor, from Susan Graham, um, I really launched into taking those bits and pieces and scraps and trying to find more about the others and, find, and to help expand the stories of who was there. I was researching about William Lee, who worked for General Washington, who was his um, body servant, and a slave from Mount Vernon. And I started getting interested in all the other people who were around them, such as Peggy, who was the laundress, a free black woman. And I found out about Hannah and Isaac, too. And it turned out that Hannah was a fascinating person. She lived to be 104 years old, actually, and she's interviewed when she was 102 years old. And so just that made me wonder, what was her life like? What I learned about Hannah was that she was there and present in the records, but you really had to search for her. The way I first learned about her was through uh, looking at some of the account books, and you kept seeing names like um, um, Negro Hannah or Isaac, money for Isaac to buy things. Through working for the general for six and a half years and for a few months for Lafayette, she and her husband earned their uh, enough money to buy their freedom and name themselves Hannah Till. So it's shorthand to call her Hannah Till. But during the time that she was at Valley Forge, she would have been known as Servant Hannah or Negro Hannah. And it turned out that these people were right there, part of Washington's family of his household, as he would say. The, the servants and the slaves who were there, who in the background were keeping everything running. Uh, it really helped us open up the story to show that George Washington's headquarters was a very, very busy place. People coming and going, uh, uh, congressmen coming in to check on things and, and officers coming by and soldiers on relief uh, coming by. And, and then who is keeping all of those things running? It, until Mrs. Washington got there, it would have been Mrs. Thompson, who was the, the uh, housekeeper and traveled with George Washington for many years. And uh, Peggy uh, and Hannah and Isaac, all of them were there so making sure that everything was running smoothly and running well. And then when Mrs. Washington would come in, she would step into that role of managing the household, but she, they would um, work with and for her as uh, they were going along. Um, so when you're trying to piece together a story of someone who has not been written about as extensively as the officers at Valley Forge, per se, 
you do have to collect sources where you can can find them and piece those sources together because in their lifetime these individuals were not considered important enough to write about or another way to look at it sometimes your your presence is in between the day-to-day -day items that are written down so the sources that we used that I used for uh, researching Hannah's life came down to the account books. She was interviewed um, for the Annals of Philadelphia. And in this account, it listed that she was a pastry cook, that she was a pastry chef. So think about this, George Washington traveling through and during the time of the, the American Revolution was traveling with people who were skilled enough to have a specialty, such as being a pastry cook. George Washington was trying to upkeep the, the trappings of civility, even in the midst of the hardships of war, because of how you were expected to be in, a time, in that time in the 18th century. It was a, a genuinely time. Uh, and he, they were just not backwoods people. Um, they were trying to make sure that people knew that they were fighting for freedom, for freedom for their country, that they were of the same level as the English gentlemen and officers. Hannah and Isaac and the others who were working in the general's household were adding to that sense of normalcy for George Washington's level and expectation of a person of his status. So in Hannah, you had a story of a person who was working for people who were fighting for freedom while she was being held in bondage. How do you reconcile that? They fight, Isaac, they fight for the cause of freeing this nation. They fight for the same hopes and dreams as everyone else. How do George Washington's officers, such as John Lawrence and Alexander Hamilton, reconcile that? Did those young men go along with the prevailing idea that it was fine to talk about slavery, uh, you know, fine to talk about Britain's tyranny and enslaving us while keeping others perpetually in bondage. So it brought up the, 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 the stories of how, how youth can often look at things in a different way than the elders and shake things up. All of these things were pieces that I was start to put together sitting in the windowsill at Washington's headquarters. And sometimes it could be pretty quiet there and uh, it would be time to read through the daily account records and uh, think about who else was there. But altogether, you know, I thought this was just something that I was interested in, something that was fun for me to do. By doing the research into Hannah, though, I was able to discover that people were interested in hearing not only about the well-known or the famous people who were at the encampment, but they wanted to learn more about the people that might be more like what they might have been if they had been picked up from their time and put into George Washington's time. As an interpreter, as an African-American interpreter, I'm in, expected to be able to interpret the traditional main story. 
but the story of people who look like me had once been considered an add-on, a niche. It is not. We all should be able to tell some bit of all of these stories in the normal everyday run of our interpretation and relate them to the traditional normative narrative. It doesn't take away from the narratives that we have been taught in school or that we have heard coming up. You start with a baseline and then add more variety. It becomes like a, instead of having this, the same old meal over and over and over again, it's presented more as a smorgasbord where you can get a variety and then it's a more satisfying story in the end, a more satisfying meal in the end. If you can make the people that are in these places human, it makes them uh, relatable, not so unattainable, not so much on a pedestal. That is the way that we uh, are functioning and living in this world now. It's not that they are not our heroes. We, we need to have our heroes too. But we also know that heroes stumble sometimes. It takes all people living in this world to make the experiences that we talk about in our national parks, because we're all part of a continuum, all part of it. Someday our people will be telling our story. What will they have to work with? What will they have to truly tell about the things that we are currently going through? Because what we are doing now will be affecting people for generations to come. How do I know this? Because through the park service and the stories that we tell in the, and even the ones that have been untold for far too long, we can trace the things that have uplifted us as a people and things that have torn us apart as a people. If you think life is cut and dry, um, this and not that, then you haven't really been living. Uh, that is what I hope people will be able to take from, um, from Hannah's story and the research that we've done. The larger story has to be broken down into smaller parts. And if you can take a person such as Hannah and break the story down into a part that someone out there can identify with, that's doing an incredible service to those who come and visit our, our, our special places that we, that we protect and preserve. And so that's why I've, I've worked so hard to these past nine years to bring her story to life. And I feel very honored and privileged to be able to do that, to be able to speak for someone who wasn't allowed to speak back when they were alive.